uh, have you seen anything that would indicate he has grown or will grow? And I guess that's my question, because I think somebody has to grow and to be president. You don't learn how to do it. You don't get the right education. As a leader, you either make it or you don't. Iowa but Falls, thank you. Well, hope uh, reigns eternal. I, I could not say that I have any reason to believe that, that Mike Dukakis cannot grow. Uh, I do agree with you, however, that in my impression, as, as I believe uh, fairly uh, was the one you expressed, uh, is that he is a, he is a first-rate manager. There's no question he is an executive who has both led and managed the state of Massachusetts uh, extraordinarily well. Uh, no one takes that away from him. Uh, but I also agree that uh, with, with what I said before and what, what you were commenting on, that he does not show, he is not showing right now in this campaign uh, a, a depth and richness uh, that usually is taken to include the growth factor, if you will. A little less than 10 minutes left in our discussion of politics with Michael Pakenham, editorial page editor of the New York Daily News, Riverside, California. Your next call. Yes, uh, I just wanted to make a comment. Do, do either one of your guests believe that uh, either Mike the caucus or Albert Gore was aware that uh, <coughs> there, was, there was a first use nuclear strike uh, policy in NATO before the uh, debacle with the questions that they made uh, or statements they made uh, yesterday or the day before. And uh, I want to, if I can just follow on, I, I also want to make a comment about uh, the, the seeming desire for conservatives to uh, attack Jesse Jackson, who guys like Pat Buchanan and, and others and <clears throat> President Reagan have claimed was unelectable, but they seem determined to continue to per perpetuate that idea. I guess they're trying to create a self-fulfilling prophecy. I'll wait to hear your comments. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure what Pat Buchanan's motivations are, uh, and I wouldn't, wouldn't assume that I'll figure them out. Um, the, uh, as to Gore and Dukakis on nuclear policy, I, I think that uh, Senator Gore is as well informed on defense policy as anybody in government. Uh, that's a sweeping uh, generality, but he has the one, th the one area in which he has really convincing uh, experience and credentials <clears throat> is in defense policy. So he knows what he's talking about when he talks. He's got very good technical command of the details, the mechanisms, the history. Uh, of U.S. defense policy and, and much of the rest of U.S. foreign policy. Uh, as to Dukakis, uh, he does not have that experience. He's a smart man. Uh, he uh, should be able to read and listen to briefings, which he certainly is entitled to get. Uh, he does not right now showing and didn't in this flap about uh, nuclear weapons uh, day before yesterday. Uh, didn't, didn't show a, a depth of understanding or perhaps just an, aware, an acute awareness of the nuances of, of, of uh, terms of art in the great nuclear debate, which just scares the bejesus out of a lot of people. In the discussion of the Democratic presidential candidates, one name that, that does come up each time the candidates are discussed is New York Governor Cuomo, whether or not there will be a draft Cuomo movement. You're from New York. What are your thoughts? Oh, it's fascinating. Uh, everybody talks about it. I think that... Uh, I, no, no one I know uh, understands the depth of Mario Cuomo's very complicated mind. Uh, I, I know Governor Cuomo fairly well, and I uh, think he's uh, an honest and candid person, but he's also a very complicated person. Um, so I hesitate to, to, to guess what his motives are, because he's got more levels of awareness than, than a lot of people do. I think he wants to be President of the United States. Uh, I think he looked over the prospects uh, a year ago or so, or more, and said to himself that he would probably lose in a, a year-long and longer uh, set of primary battles. Uh, that he either didn't have the expectation of being able to conquer all these other forces or just didn't want to go through the hassle and the money raising and all of the other things that are very tough about it. Um, I believe right now, and it's purely personal, that uh, if the rest of this campaign produces severe wounds to Dukakis, doesn't make Gore emerge as a convincing single candidate, if the Democratic Party goes to the Atlantic Convention, 
uh, without having resolved who their nominee is, um, that, uh, that Mario Cuomo will be there available for whatever you want to call it, uh, a draft or a brokered <coughs> nomination. Uh, is he working hard for it? No, he's not. Uh, is he out there manipulating and making deals and meeting in back rooms? I'm fairly sure he's not doing that either. Uh, would that help him? I doubt it. So he's still doing the right things to be the default nominee. Dallas, Texas, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I think Mr. Buckingham is getting a free ride himself. Uh, he said so many uh, misstatements, whether they're based on ignorance or uh, basically an anti-Semitic racist attitude. Uh, he called the PLO as a te recognized terrorist organization. I would like to tell you, sir, uh, that the PLO is uh, accepted by the Vatican, by the Pope, as a liberation movement for freedom and justice. Uh, Israel, the <coughs> Israeli uh, members at the Knesset, which is the Israeli parliament, have met with the PLO uh, leadership and the chairman. Uh, you, basically, nothing but a, a Zionist slave who would like to, to please some fanatic person like Koch and, and some other people. Uh, please, before you make such a, a stupid statement, uh, people are informed. The American people do know better. Whatever you are trying to say to please your bosses or the people who uh, paid your uh, suits, and ties and your glasses are lovely. Uh, this is, doesn't work anymore. Dallas, thanks for the call. <laughs> I don't think I'll bother. Our guest for the past 45 minutes has been Michael Pankinem, editorial page editor of the New York Daily News. We'd like to thank him for being with us. We're live from the JW Marriott Hotel in downtown Washington in just a few minutes. Uh, Democratic presidential candidate Jesse Jackson will be addressing the annual meeting of the American Society of Newspaper Editors. Uh, his car has arrived. Uh, Mr. Jackson is in the building. He should be uh, starting his speech in, in just a few moments. So we'll take time to take uh, one or two more phone calls before that happens. Our next call is from Chicago. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Go right ahead. Uh, the, uh, in spite of the great love I have for C-SPAN, you know, I, I, I have to say that I still think that the, the world news is being censored and manipulated by C-SPAN and the other major network media. As examples, I would like to cite the total blackout of what's going on in the Philippines and there, since there was a very decided swing to the right over there with the formation of the right-wing vigilantes to fight the communists in the Philippines. As another example, I would like to cite the almost total blackout of the slaughter of the PLO in Shabra and Shatila outside of Beirut, Lebanon. <clears throat> the very same camps, uh, they were slaughtered by the Shiite Amal militia over there. Caller, we're trying to, caller, let me ask you, since we're focusing on politics during this portion of our program, do you have a question that would relate to domestic politics? Well, why are you guys blacking out the campaign of uh, Vice President George Bush? I mean, okay. I, I've been watching, and it seems like you give one-fifth the time. Well, thanks for the call, Chicago. Th that is correct. I can't speak for C-SPAN, but I can certainly speak for, for newspapers who are not giving the space or attention or time, if you will, to the Bush campaign because right now the Democratic Party has a contested primary sequence going on and right now the assumption is that George Bush has divine intervention uh, 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 barred uh, the Republican nomination all locked up. Um, as soon as the, the Democrats and Republicans have uh, have two candidates in the field, you'll find that the coverage is about identical. Uh, right now, George Bush's interests are best served by not making a lot of noise, and he's not making many speeches. Woodland Hills, California. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I have a couple of comments to make. Uh, the first, uh, I find it interesting that Ronald Reagan is indignant when Speaks attributes some comments to him. And yet, when Colonel North and Admiral Poindexter set foreign policy, he calls them heroes. I'd like to hear your, uh, your uh, guests' comments on that. And second, I just must say this, 
Uh, in 84, I was involved with the Jews for Jesse Jackson organization here in Los Angeles. But uh, I find it interesting that a lot of Jewish people are taken aback by the Jaime remark, yet it's very common for uh, Jewish Jews to uh, use the word schwarz in talking about blacks. Now, a lot of blacks would take that as a negative as well, yet it's very common and they use it all the time. California, thanks for the call. Um, on, on the second, on the Jackson thing, I think that what people are reacting to, uh, what was, uh, we see a great deal of this in New York, which has a, a large and, and a complex and very articulate Jewish community. Uh, it's not the Jaime Town remark in itself. Um, and it's not even meeting with Arafat in itself. Uh, it is that a lot of, a lot of American Jews are convinced uh, right or wrong, and I think they're probably wrong, that Jesse Jackson has lurking in the back of his mind uh, a strong and dangerous to them animus against, if not Jews categorically, at least against the state of Israel. There is a fear uh, that he really, really is not on their side. And I think that that fear is articulated in all kinds of, of ways that, that, uh, that come up when the Heimitown remark is cited and, and the rest of it. One floor below where we are in the JW Marriott Hotel is uh, one of the main wall rooms where Democratic presidential candidate Jesse Jackson will be speaking in a few minutes. We'll take a look at that room where that speech will be coming up while we take our next call from Philadelphia. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I noticed uh, that the gentleman who columnized uh, Jesse Jackson for an extensive period of time was not interrupted. I'd like to see the same courtesy. I, uh, I listen to a gentleman ask the question uh, regarding the difference between the Democrat and the Republican Party and uh, implying that there really was no difference, that there, uh, each party was trying to figure out how to attack Nicaragua, either by land or by sea. Uh, Pavlov had dogs, and he trained them. Every time he rang a bell, they salivated. It seems like the newspapers work on the same principle. If they want to get a thing going uh, to instruct voters to vote right wing, uh, they cry communist, 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 communist. Uh, the fellows uh, just have to look at the biography of Mr. Michael there, and you'll know what he comes into the game with in terms of uh, personal prejudice. Now, I want to know uh, Upton Sinclair wrote the brass check many, many years ago. Philadelphia, I'm going to have to let you go on that point because we are going to bring you live coverage of the speech by Jesse Jackson. That's coming up at just a few moments here in the JW Marriott Hotel. Mr. Jackson has entered the main ballroom and we'll go there now. Marion Barry of Washington, D.C. And now while well, uh, Reverend Jackson is greeting the hotel guests before I introduce his introducer. I mean, yeah. <laughs> the head table guest. <clears throat> One important uh, acknowledgement I'd like to make, and that is today we had uh, President Arias here because of the very good uh, help that we got from the Gannett Company in sending a, an airplane to Costa Rica to bring him here to Washington, and we're very grateful. And now I'd like to introduce Bill Kovach of the Atlanta Journal and Constitution to introduce uh, Reverend Jackson. Thank you. Uh, again, in the interest of time, I'm going to forego the uh, biographical data about this man whom you all know. I would like to, by way of introduction, just make one observation. One thing has been made absolutely clear about uh, the Reverend Jesse Jackson this year. Whether you like him or dislike him, whether you agree with him or disagree with him, his campaign has added a new luster to the dream of a democratic society. And popular elections in America will never be the same because of his tenacity and his commitment to the process. Let's welcome the Reverend Jesse Jackson. Mr. 
Mr. Carvis, let me express my thanks to you for your kind and generous introduction uh, to all of you who are here today and for having this invitation and opportunity to speak from before you. We were in Buffalo earlier this day and had some plane difficulties, but we were able to make an adjustment and to get here. And so for the few minutes of waiting, let me express to you uh, my apologies and our thanks for your waiting. Let me express my appreciation and delight in having the opportunity to be with you today to share a few basic observations on security in the modern world. The next president of the United States will face momentous choices about how to protect this nation, strengthen its people, and preserve its democratic institutions. The decisions made will set the tone and the direction of American foreign policy for a new century. A fundamental reassessment of our security priorities is long overdue. This must be grounded not on ideological presuppositions, but on a new realism about the world in which we live, a sober assessment of our real security concerns. Our national security policy today is still based largely upon assumptions and institutions developed immediately after World War II. Think of the world 40 years ago. Stalin ruled in Moscow and communism appeared to be on the march. Western Europe and Japan were devastated by the war. What we now know as the Third World was just beginning its struggle against colonial rule. We were the world's preeminent power. We alone had the secret of the atomic bomb. We enjoyed an, an economic boom fueled by pent-up wartime demand and savings. We represented the voice of democracy and human rights across the globe. From this reality came post-war strategy. Nuclear superiority would deter Soviet adventure. A grand alliance would contain Soviet expansion. A global commitment to intervene in civil wars and confront insurgencies from Greece to Indochina, from Iran to Central America, would forestall the spread of communism. We would police the world, even as we aided our allies and former enemies to rebuild the global economy. The world has changed dramatically since that time. The Soviet Union has built a nuclear arsenal equal to our own. Europe and Japan have recovered. Their modern economies are competitive with our own. Uh, communism holds no appeal to these democracies. Indeed, the Soviet system falls increasingly behind the modern economies of the West. A third world has been born. With over 100 countries coming to independence, they now struggle against grinding poverty and despair, torn by a conflict of tribalism, nationalism, religious fervor, and financial austerity. And we have changed. Our economy is still strong, but we are more and more dependent on a global economy over which we have less and less control. We're becoming overly dependent on foreign capital, foreign investment, and foreign energy under Reagan and Bush. We've gone from the world's largest creditor to its larger debtor nation. Growing private wealth coexists with deepening public squalor as pressing investments in education, in children, in infrastructure, in health care go unmet, our military is the strongest in the world. We have learned at great cost in Vietnam, in Lebanon, the limits of military power. Our challenges, too, have changed. Today, surely the number one threat in the streets of our nation is not alien ideologists, but illegal substances, drugs. Drugs are not simply a domestic problem, the pressing dimension of our foreign policy as well. Either the most inept dimension of our foreign policy or the most corrupt dimension of our foreign policy. In terms of security of our children, of our streets, indeed of ourselves, surely the threat of drugs is a clear and present danger to our national security. Our policy must be changed to fit the new realities. We must change our course or lose our way. But change is always difficult. Institutional inertia stands against it. Conventional wisdom 
stands and argues against it. Fear mongers rail against it. Too often politicians cater to prejudice and polls rather than mold opinion for the common good. Over the last seven years, the Reagan-Bush administration has chosen virtually to ignore these realities. They have truly represented a reaction, a search for a nostalgic past, blind to challenges of this day. After seven years of Reagan-Bush, America's military budget has doubled. The largest peacetime military buildup in our history. Are we more secure now than we were at an earlier time? Have we expanded our influence in Latin America, in Africa, or the Middle East? After seven years, more Israelis are dead, more Palestinians are dead, more Arabs are dead, more Nicaraguans and South Africans are dead, Americans are still being held hostage in the Middle East. After seven years, our country has sacrificed much of its moral authority and force in the world. The Reagan-Bush administration has sold missiles to the Ayatollah, illegally shipped guns to the countries, deceived our allies, spurned the law, and lied to the Congress and the American people. After seven years, we're losing the war on drugs, in part because it has not been our priority. We've not really fought the war on drugs. Instead, we have retained relations with dope-dealing generals, arms merchants, and bandits in an obsession with three million Sandinistas who do not threaten us. And if so, 15,000 countries could not save us from them. But we have a strong military, the strongest in the world, but weak leadership. Too many guided missiles and too few sensible minds. We need more than a new face in the White House. We need a new realism and a new direction. The nuclear arms race. We must address the fundamental threat to our survival. The nuclear arms race. Thus far, we've avoided Armageddon. The threat of nuclear war poisons the dreams and blights the futures of our children every day. Today, the U.S. and the Soviet Union have between us over 50,000 nuclear warheads. The Soviet Union poses a direct threat to our security, and will continue to do so as long as it possesses weapons that, that can destroy us all, and they still exist there and in our continent. Surely the primary goal of U.S. security and our policy must be to reduce and ultimately to eliminate this threat. History has demonstrated that no nuclear weapons will make us safer or give us any meaningful advantage. The search for superiority is a dangerous illusion. No technical breakthrough can make us invulnerable. Star Wars system is, an, is, not, is not security. It's, it's a fantasy. It is a nightmare. The INF Accord is a small step in the right direction. Deep cuts in strategic arms represent a good second step. And even with deep cuts, we would possess an arsenal able to destroy the Soviet Union many times over. Both START and INF are too limited. Neither would end the technological arms race. Under both, every new weapon system we can imagine could be developed. The same is true for the Soviet Union. The arsenal would grow faster, more accurate, and more dangerous. If SDI takes the arms race to the heavens, it may soon literally become lunatic. Agreements in which old weapons are dismantled and new ones developed will not make us safer. Agreements that speak a conventional arms buildup will not make us more secure. We must seek another way. Arms control must become part of an arms reduction process. Not a tactical ploy in a continuing arms race. Both sides must make a commitment to reduce nuclear and conventional armaments, to slow and eventually to stop the technological arms race. This requires that individual agreements be a part of a broad conceptual framework for orderly reduction of both conventional and nuclear forces. That is why, as president, I would initiate a nuclear testing and missile testing moratorium, challenging the Soviets to join. If we can then negotiate a verifiable comprehensive test ban treaty 
and a ban on new missile deployment, we can slow the modernization that drives the arms race. The negotiated conventional force reductions, necessarily asymmetrical to reflect our differing forces, we might begin to redirect the energy. Imagination and wealth of the nation to rebuilding our cities, educating our children, and rekindling the hopes on which the society is based. Any significant arms reduction will require a changed political relationship between our country and the Soviet Union. 25 years ago, President Kennedy called for a new beginning in U.S.-Soviet relations in a speech at American University. Today, transformation of our relationship is both more necessary and more possible. In the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev appears to lead a new direction, a new generation of leaders intent upon making dramatic reforms in the country. Gorbachev has explicitly stated that these reforms require a new course in foreign policy. His call for new thinking poses new challenges and new opportunities for bold leadership in our country. For the first time since World War II, it may lie within our power to transform the global competition into a more cooperative and constructive relationship. Developing this relationship has its risks, but is in the mutual interest of our country and the Soviet Union, and it is also the right and timely thing to do. We should take the leadership in forging a new era of cooperation and engagement with the Soviet Union. Armed negotiations should be accompanied by efforts to settle regional crisis, the recent agreement of the withdrawal of Soviet troops from Afghanistan illustrates the possibilities. Joint ventures in exploring space, encountering the threats to humanity, the depletion of the atmosphere, the destruction of rainforests, the spread of malnutrition and disease, the plague of drugs should be explored and launched where possible. Trade and cultural exchange must be expanded. If we develop this new relationship, we must give high priority to engaging our European allies. The Reagan-Bush foreign policy is one of unilateralism. Our allies were informed of actions already taken rather than consulted on decisions yet to be made. We can and must do better for greater cooperation is critical to our economy as well as to our defense. At the same time, our allies in Europe must assume greater responsibility for their own conventional defense. We spend $150 billion a year defending Europe and Japan 42 years after the war. In Europe, our allies have one and one-half times the population and more than twice the gross national product of the Soviet Union. They can share some of the burden. But our goal must be to reduce the burden for everyone. Major reductions in Western military forces can only occur as a consequence of major reductions in Soviet forces. Only sensible and verifiable arms reduction agreements can produce this. That must be the first priority of any president. Our country and the third world. Let us not forget, however, that when our country and the Soviet Union sit at the negotiating table, only one-eighth of the world is represented. Seven-eighths of the world is outside of that meeting. Most of the world is not white not male, not prosperous, and does not speak English. It is in the struggle for power and influence in the world that we have expended the greatest number of lives and resources in the, in the Cold War. And nowhere is a new realism more necessary than the third world where seven-eighths of the human race lives. The Reagan administration has viewed the third world as a chessboard in which a struggle for pawns and positions would be played out with the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, President Reagan said, lies behind all the trouble spots in the world. A gross underestimation of people's intelligence and will to be free and quest for legitimate self-determination. From this perspective came the Reagan doctrine, the commitment to intervene against any government or frustrate any movement that did not meet with American approval. Inevitably, the Reagan doctrine entailed open contempt for international law. 
Illustrated now withdrawal from the world court after mining the harbors of Nicaragua. It entailed unilateral action, spurning the opinions and objections of our allies. It finally entailed secrecy and deception to avoid the protests of our people and the constraints of the U.S. Congress. The Reagan doctrine is based on a fundamental misconception of the world. The countries of the third world are not drawn to communism. They struggle against unimaginable poverty, against the legacy of colonialism, against underdevelopment, malnutrition, and hunger. They contend with the mighty currents of nationalism and religion. They tend towards non-alignment, for they seek aid and investment where they can find it, wherever they can find it. Any president must be prepared to use military force as a last resort to defend our nation and fulfill our treaty commitments. Yet surely by now we have learned that we do not gain influence or prestige by acting as midwife to governments in Iran, Guatemala, or Chile, or propping up unpopular dictators in Haiti, Zaire, or the Philippines. The Soviets have learned the limits of military intervention in Afghanistan, have clearly begun to realize that every government that calls itself communist and seeks aid from Moscow is not an asset. That is why I call for a new doctrine to guide our policy. A set of guidelines far more pragmatic than the ideological fixations that have too often distorted our policy and our worldview. First, we must support international institutions and respect international law. Nowhere does the Reagan administration do our national interests greater disservice than in their contempt for international law and institutions. As a rich nation with global interests, we have the greatest state in a legal order that legitimizes our presence. If our presence is seen as Ill illegitimate across the globe, no military force will be powerful enough to protect us and our interests. Similarly, as a great power, we must support the international organizations that can address transnational problems like malnutrition, AIDS, drought, and acid rain. Second, we must recognize the right of self-determination. Struggling peoples in the world today will choose any form of government and many forms in their political economy. Some will not be to our liking, but we should respect their right to choose their own destiny. Third, we must support human rights. Our foreign policy should reflect our values, our concerns for freedom of speech and press, of religion, for due process and equal protection under the laws. Growth and repeated violations of human rights should not be recipients of USAID or trade preferences. Finally, we must be a force for economic growth and justice. Development in the third world is the security need of our country. Without development, there will be no peace. Without peace, there will be no growth. Without growth in the third world, we should not be enforcing austerity upon the impoverished, but taking the lead and lifting the debt burden that have dashed any hope of economic growth in much of the third world. We should be encouraging Japan not to build more weapons, to use its resources to take the lead in creating new development funds for the third world. At the same time, we should seek international cooperation to enforce basic labor rights abroad. Either the standard of living of workers abroad will rise or ours will decline. If workers abroad gain fairer wages, they can buy what we produce. We all grow together. Lastly, crisis areas. Against this backdrop of a new realism for American foreign policy, we can move constructively to address the most dangerous trouble spots in the world today. The fact is, we are placing more emphasis on military might, on our respect for human rights, self-determination, international law, and cooperation. Our foreign policy must serve our interests and serve those of our allies. At the decades of conflict, neither the Israelis nor the Palestinians have security or peace. Each night, we witness the human pain and suffering that generates only more anger and more violence. The Israelis and the Palestinians are locked in a death grip. Neither has the security to let the other go. 
We must do for them what neither can do for themselves. Move them from confrontation, mutual annihilation, mutual destruction, occupation, and despair to dialogue, mutual recognition, and coexistence. That's the challenge of leadership. We must challenge the Palestinian leadership to accept Israel's right to exist within secure borders. Just as we must challenge Israel to recognize the Palestinian right to self-determination with security. I welcome the initiative of Secretary of State Schultz to begin a dialogue between the U.S. government and Jewish and Arab Americans. We urgently need their help to support the work towards a solution, a just solution in the Middle East. The Secretary's endorsement of an international conference, his adherence to UN Resolution 242, in exchange for land for peace for all, in my judgment, are positive steps in the right direction toward ending the crisis. To solve the crisis, we need active leadership. As President, I would appoint a personal emissary of highest reputation to doggedly pursue the conversations to their proper conclusion. We must offer incentives for agreement, not threats against objection. If we can move the Israelis and the Palestinians beyond war and beyond fear, think of the possibility. Beyond occupation and war, Israel could be a trading and manufacturing center for the Middle East and Africa. Beyond fear and war is the possibility of security, peace, economic growth, and prosperity, all beyond occupation and war. In Southern Africa, we must take the lead in the struggle against apartheid. We must convene a summit of the frontline states to offer them the assistance they need to defend themselves from South African aggression and gain economic independence. We must work to get both South African and Cuban troops out of Angola and to free Namibia from occupation. Then we must engage our allies in full sanctions against South Africa. The bill introduced by Representative Ron Dellums in the House provides a legal authority for all sanctions and for full sanctions. We must actively and resolutely see if we have any chance of avoiding any greater tragedy in South Africa. If we do these things, reverse the arms race, build international institutions, embrace the Jackson Doctrine, international law, self-determination, human rights, economic development, and consistency, we will dramatically increase our security. We can also cut our military spending without cutting our defense and use that money to invest in America, in our children, in education, in health care and daycare, indeed in falling bridges. If we just freeze our spending now, we can save $60 billion a year by 1993. These views are consistent with our interests. They chart a new course through new realities, but are grounded in traditional values. Too often convention and caution silences common sense. But leadership must seek the truth and stand for it even when it is not popular. A new direction can only come from a leadership bold enough to define it and citizenry confident enough to embrace it. As I have traveled this land this election season, I can report this to you today. American people are ready for a new direction. They're coming together across lines of race, color, and religion, and a call for economic justice at home and peace abroad. A new majority will support a new realism in our front and our military policy. This is a moment of great change. It's a time for our country once again to take the initiative to use its power to promote a stable peace and take the initiative to have real growth in the world economy. It's time to turn our energy to address the new threats facing this generation. The flow of drugs into this country, the ecological crisis, the deterioration of our air, the poisoning of our water supply, temperature changes that threaten floods of famine, a rural economic crisis that threatens to engulf our economy in a collapse triggered by the inability of poor countries to pay their debts. In these questions, the Soviet Union barely figures, yet all are far less remote than the Soviet invasion of Europe, or a 30-day nuclear war at sea for which we devote so much of our treasure 
our energy, and our imagination. The next president must know the world and have a realistic understanding of our possibilities. The next president must change our direction and seek peace for our land. Thank you very much. Reverend Jackson has agreed to take questions. If you will remember the ground rules, questions only for members, uh, from members of ASNE. Identify yourself and your newspaper, please. And while there are people making their way to the microphones, let me ask an initial question. Reverend Jackson, you have talked eloquently of keeping drugs away from the borders of our country. Uh, you've never really spelled out specifically how you would keep drugs away from the borders of our country. Could you tell us, please? Of those running for the office, uh, I'm the only one who's put forth a five-point plan and a budget. Step one, convene Latin American leaders and countries where drugs are grown, starting in Latin America because we are members of the same hemisphere. While we put all of our focus on the democracies or the integrity of their democracies being threatened by communism, fascist drug lords are driving through courthouses and killing judges and undermining their democracy. I'm as willing to defend an ally with supplies from being overthrown by drug laws as from any alien ideology. Those countries must be offered alternative crops, or must be offered substitute crops, offered economic development. We cannot send Ireland by and maintain good relations. In fact, while within their country, the seeds of death are being sown for the American people. It starts, A, therefore, stopping drug flow at the source where it's grown. Secondly, strengthening our Coast Guard and strengthening our borders. We have a 500 plus naval fleet now. A substantial number of those ships are not on alert. We've cut the Coast Guard budget by $100 million. The Coast Guard interdicted 10,000 pounds of cocaine in 1986, 26,000 pounds in 1987. Then we cut the Coast Guard budget by $100 million which in fact gave the drug traffickers a green light coming this way. We could dispatch 30 to 40 ships under Coast Guard auspices even now to strengthen our borders in the Keys of Florida where the three choke points are, as well as on the Mac Island, Texas side where there's such a gap. We've got 300 border patrolmen covering 600 miles with one boat, one helicopter, and 12 horses. <laughs> Thirdly, Places around the country, waiting lines are six to eight months for people who are sick on drugs that want to get well. There must be more investment in rehabilitation and fourth education for our youth in their formative years. At least a three billion dollar budget must be allocated to in fact engage in a, in a serious war against drugs. Lastly, as president, I could substantially cut the supply of drugs, but the people must cut the demand for the drugs. And what makes it a very difficult struggle is we're spending $150 billion a year. We've gone from thinking it was just the immorality of poor people and pleasure for the rich to now knowing that children are not buying $150 billion worth of drugs a year. Ball players are not laundering $100 billion worth of drugs a year. That's corruption in high places, protecting drug traffickers, drug warlords, and drug pushes. We may not have ever seen a threat to our security and fabric before in our history, quite like the flow of cocaine, crack, heroin, and PCP into our society. Reverend Jackson, Larry Kramer from the San Francisco Examiner. Um, you've never been elected to public office, and more importantly, perhaps, you've never run a government of any size. Why should you start at the top? Let's look at the qualifications for the office. First, you have to be old enough and American enough. And you have to be a leader who can set a direction. The Mr. Reagan and Mr. Bush both have 
adequate resumes, but let's look at the deficit and the debt and the trade imbalance and our dilemma in Latin America, in the Middle East, and in South Africa. Some office holders are not leaders, and some leaders are not office holders. If you look at this campaign, what issues have set the pace? A, a leader must strengthen and respect and know the law. I can do that better than this administration has, and it's been elected twice. It must set the moral tone for the country. I've done that for this campaign. It must determine priorities. Drugs are now the number one issue. Now, my competitors are now putting drugs on commercials as a great issue, and they are officers in this war against drugs, and Mr. Meese has now gone to Latin America uh, after seven years. But of all the officers, I am the commanding general in this war. I have set the pace on the agenda. Now, there's a great challenge to challenge corporate America, to, in fact, to be fair, or uh, to reinvest in America. Well, challenging corporations in economic violence, I've set that pace. I put forth an agenda with numbers, a plan for budget deficit reduction. I put forth a plan for the use of pension funds, government secured, fair rate of return guaranteed, to invest in affordable housing and infrastructure. And so, beyond the basic qualifications, one must be a leader. And of those running, I offer that leadership alternative and that direction that will build, together, that will build the American family and make us, and make us well. Uh, Arnold Friedman, Union News in Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, Reverend Jackson, you have advocated a dialogue between American Jews and Arabs to discuss Mideast problems, and yet you have refused a dialogue between American Jews and Jesse Jackson, which might point the way towards reinstituting the black Jewish coalition that was so important in the civil rights movement. Could you explain why? Well, that's not true. Uh, when we first got to New York, for example, on the very first day I was endorsed by Barry Feinstein of the Teamsters Union. Next day, met with a couple of hundred labor leaders, a significant number of which were, were Jewish. I met with Jewish labor leaders, a group of business leaders presided over by uh, uh, Peter Strauss on, on Monday morning. I met with Jewish publishers and writers. I've been endorsed by Nation Magazine. Uh, a lot of Jewish persons are involved by Village Voice, uh, just two days ago, and we keep reaching out to every level of the Jewish community. Now, we must reserve the right, given the tensions there, to determine the highest and best and most effective use of our time. But let's step behind that. It didn't just start with the heat of, of the campaign. When Mr. Reagan went to Wittberg to lay the wreath, I went to Strettenhoff at the same time with Bruno Kreisky, opening up dialogue and, and paving the way for healing. When Mr. Reagan went to see Mr. Gorbachev in Geneva, I saw Mr. Gorbachev as well, and appealed to him beyond stopping the deployment of the missiles and testing, to also free Soviet Jewry and the Armenians as well. For I know that the absence of missiles is not the presence of human rights. I also know that when tensions come down, there's simply more access and more immigration. A few weeks ago, Elizabeth Holtzman uh, discovered that um, a Lois Bruner, a Nazi war criminal, was in Syria. She couldn't turn to any of the other candidates to seek help. She called me. I made contacts to, to Assad and appeal for his extradition. And so I continued the dialogue and continued the work. And so it's fair to say that our outreach has been extensive both within our campaign structure and groups that we have chosen to meet with. And we simply must reserve the right to determine the priorities of our schedule. It certainly has been an outreach and it has been substantial. We have the most multicultural, the most diverse campaign staff and constituent support base. When one goes to New York, and this is important for the press to respect, to be sure there's a significant factor there relative to the Jewish population. It should not be stereotyped. 
some Jewish people are Republicans. And not many of them want to meet with me or any Democrat. Some Jewish people support the Likud wing of the Middle East arrangement. Some labor, some peace now. We should not stereotype in that wise, therefore. But beyond that, in New York, there are more Haitians who live in New York than who remain in Haiti. And there's no demand by the press to meet with Haitians or discuss Haitian policy. A demand by my competitors to meet with Haitians. In New York, there's real concern about, about Panama because so many Panamanians live in, in New York. And how we relate to Panama now and how that ties into the countries is a very real matter for a serious broad-based foreign policy. In New York, there are more African descendants than any place in the world except Nigeria and, and Brazil. And yet no demand that my competitors of either party meet with certain levels of, of black leadership or to meet with Irish leaders with whom I will meet and stay. I have reached out, unlike any other candidate, to the Irish, to the Italian, to the Jews, to the Haitians, to the Hispanics, to the Puerto Ricans, to the blacks. Mine is a representative, a very broad-based campaign, the broadest of all. The far left. The far left. Our far left. Yes. <laughs> Terry Brennan, the Mercury in Pottstown, Pennsylvania. Reverend Jackson, our dollar bills say we put our trust in God. Our Pledge of Allegiance says we are a nation under God. We have, however, banished God from our schools. It is a suggestion that if we were to return God to our classrooms, we might be able to keep drugs out of them. If you were elected president, what could you do and what would you do to return prayer to our schools? Even presidents cannot banish God or even move God one iota. God remains God and God remains everywhere. God is in, is in our schools. But in a public school where you have uh, many religions involved, there must be the sensitivity to other religions. Prayer in school, a, a moment of silence, a, a moment of meditation and, re and reciting the Lord's Prayer must not be seen as commensurate with a program to drive out drugs no more than say no to drugs drives out drugs. I support high ethical and moral standards, but I submit to you, my friend, that in these schools, as long as you teach physics and have exams on Friday, you'll have some prayer in school. <laughs> but Thank you. But the administration that fought the hardest for prayer in schools has locked the effect of prayer out of the White House. And therefore, you have the most indictments in the highest sleaze fact in American history. And so I feel disturbed when people, in a sense, take something as serious as religion and as sacred and as personal and literally manipulate prayer because prayer really emanates from one's heart. One cannot be stopped from praying and presidents cannot move God one iota. If that was the far left, let's try the far right. <laughs> Phil Schock, the Daily Journal, Elizabeth, New Jersey. We understand your campaign is following suit today in Jersey City, asking the state Democratic Party there to change its primary ballot rules, which now force voters to select individual delegates as well as pulling the beauty contest lever for their presidential choice. The Democrats don't make the change. Uh, what will your strategy be uh, uh, in Jersey? And uh, is this a form of party discrimination? I do not know about the details of that particular suit. My thrust simply has been to challenge the party to open up, to make room for new Democrats, because a key to winning is to expand. And I have therefore registered more new voters than anybody who voted Democratic and did not make thresholds so high that they had the impact of discouraging people and therefore locking them out. I say to party leaders, do not turn buoyant grapes of hope in the raisins of despair in the spring. 
and then expect them to be revived into buoyant grapes of hope in the fall. Let's protect the feelings of voters and let's be right by them all. I hope that matters like that can be resolved, frankly, in heads up negotiations and not to the courts. But if, if they must be, uh, let them be. But I'm not going to divert the efforts of my campaign of hope in, into the particulars of a given local challenge. I'm David Corcoran from the record in Hackensack, New Jersey. Mr. Jackson, you said in your remarks that most of the world is uh, neither white nor male. Um, the group that you see before you is largely male and overwhelmingly white. What advice would you give this organization as it tries to broaden its membership uh, to better reflect the uh, uh, minority population of the United States? The first, the organization ought to see the advantage of expanding its cultural base and therefore expanding its worldview. One of my reasons for resisting the English only syndrome, whatever security it may give people to know that our language uh, has religious value and is dominant, within this hemisphere there's not the dominant language. Two-thirds of this hemisphere is, is Latin Americans who speak Spanish and Portuguese for the main. Our strength is in expanding our language, expanding our culture, reducing Mexican and Brazilian debt, and therefore expanding our economy. And so my alarm goes off when I sense these walls and retreats as opposed to expansions uh, and growth. We are a blessed nation to be a sixth of the world's population and be so dominant in the world. Or between us and the Soviets, one-eighth of the, of, the, uh, of the population to in fact have such power over the other seven-eighths. But clearly they, they are growing in power and growing in, in, in demands. And in some instances growing in danger. Because nuclear proliferation that is uncontrolled for the most part is taking place in the seven-eighths. The poverty is in the 70s, while the U.S. and the Soviet go back and forth in hard negotiations and posturing and positioning. The outbreaks are in Latin America, or in Afghanistan, or in the Persian Gulf, or in the Middle East, and South Africa. Uh, when Mr. Reagan and Mr. Gorbachev met to sign the um, uh, INF agreement, my greatest fear was in the middle of the celebration that uh, an American made weapon in Iran or uh, may have been fired on an American ship in the Persian Gulf, which would have obligated us to shoot back uh, because we would have been fired upon, at which time the, 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 the bubble of the balloon would have been burst simply by an uncontrolled element in the element of the world where seven-eighths of the world lives. It's a tremendous challenge in this room for us to expand our culture base and see the world from a different point of view. Many of us have gotten, it seems, much too used to seeing the world from the few people that we became comfortable with as friends, as allies, as business partners, as people educated in American schools, but who went back home as dictators. And invariably, they lost. Uh, the Samosas uh, and the Marcoses uh, and the Shahs of the world have gone and gone forever. New orders are there, and we must be more aggressive in relating to those new orders and understanding how to influence them. I met with some of these leaders in the third world and you immediately get scarred say, you, you met with our enemy. Well, one can only help the ally by convincing the enemy not to be an enemy. You cannot be a leader unless you can convince uh, the enemy not to attack our ally. We must, as a superpower, relate to the leaders of this world to try to change them, influence them, neutralize them, convert them. We must get tougher than we are and bolder than we are about relating to leaders of this world, even those with whom we disagree. One more question. I think our last question here. Mr. Jackson, I'm David Annable from the Christian Science Monitor. I wonder if you give us your thoughts on a question or a statement which is often made, but which is not necessarily made publicly all the time, that this country is not yet ready for a black president. I wonder if you'll give us a direct answer to that question. 
Well, the people are speaking loudly and clearly. And in a democracy, we must let the people speak. They're speaking in Iowa, in Vermont, in Maine, from Puerto Rico to Alaska, from Michigan to Mississippi. The people are speaking. I submit to you that when we keep reinforcing on the people's mind that they are not ready for uh, somebody because they are black or Hispanic or female or Jewish, it's really an attempt to keep people locked in. It's an attempt to keep America from expanding, to keep America from, from growing. Many of the people who talk that way, who dominate all the TV shows, you have a a few people talking more and more about less and less to fewer and fewer people, the kind of journalistic incest, uh, need to get out into the world where people are. They are surprised at the growth because they're not connected to those who are growing. Just as the third world has grown in the last 25 years, America has grown and gotten better in the last 25 years. We went across the South on Super Tuesday without a single cat call or boo. Not a single ugly sign at a mass meeting. It was not till we got north to New York that the litmus test for race and religion became spouted from the mouths of public officials without any significant media challenge. And then joined in yesterday by the president. And then joined in today by Mrs. Ferrara. We have an obligation as leaders to set a moral tone for our country and to expand the country and to make the country better. If you ask a race-based question, you'll get a race-based answer. For example, if you want somebody who is national security chief, who is loyal to the president, who shares much of his worldview, who has gone to the military ranks, if someone can do the job, will you accept that person? Yes. If the person's black, would it matter? No. So you get Colin Powell. If you said, should President Reagan have a black national security chief? Well, who black could do that? The race-based question gives a race-based conclusion. I mean, could, this is 1988, but should a black quarterback in the Super Bowl well, I don't know one who could do it. We don't have a black who's even been to the playoffs, so how can we get one in the Super Bowl? The only quarterback who can throw four touchdowns in one quarter. Yes, the man if he's black, well, it's perfectly all right if he's red skin. <laughs> yes. Think. I mean, the race, base questions. So I often ask this question as I speak. I do it in, this, in two ways. One, uh, I've asked large groups of farmers, if you were about tomorrow morning to lose your farm at the auction. You wanted someone to face the banker and argue your case. Now we, we got different qualifications, verse resumes. Who would you want to argue your case? Jesse. If you wanted somebody to face a major corporation tomorrow and argue the case against mergers, against the case, or for the case of reinvestment. Who'd you want to argue your case? Well, another way. If you had somebody in a foreign jail, a relative, you wanted somebody to try to get your relative back home, who would you argue, want to argue your case? Well, I've watched people have to go beyond the race issue to the issue of security. So, in this way, I close. Well, I had an hour when they kept rationing this question to say, we like the way just to talk and think and argue and debate and stand with people you know, but he's black. <laughs> so it went this way out an hour. Three farmers sitting in the barbershop debating this case. They had been to a big mass rally the night before and I inspired them with a few epigrams, which y'all call rhymes, but they're really epigrams. <laughs> and and then graphic ways of teaching, giving out lesson plans, you know. <laughs> you understand. I, I couldn't miss this chance to say that to y'all. Some people rhyme and reason, some people need to rhyme without reason. 
So one farmer said, you know, I like that Jesse Jackson. He'd be talking about keep the family together and traditional values and men cling to your wives in a time of crisis and just because his dog's going to abandon your family. So I like that. Yes, yeah, now the boy talk about good values now, but I tell you, he's black. They said, yeah, I don't think you understand what we're saying. You know, when we was about to lose our job at the plant, he marched with us. He held a picket sign, a presidential candidate with a picket sign. He marched with us on a picket line. Guess now you know he can march. He's strong on picketing. He will march for you. He's <laughs> strong on marching. But he's black. Other farmers said, look, I don't think you understand. You see, when we were losing our farm, Jackson came and argued our case at the auction, met with the banker, and got some of our land back. Because I know he can argue. You know, he brought Goodman back home from Syria. He knows how to debate and negotiate, but he's black. Guy said, but you don't understand the guy who's taking out the farm and land was white. Guy said, oh. <laughs> Thank you very much.